So we are being recorded now, Stephen and Kristen, and it's half past the hour, so over to you, Stephen. So thanks, everybody, for uh, for joining us today for this um, this really uh, great event to uh, to talk about the results from the, the TALIS survey. Um, I just want to thank everybody for taking time out of their day. I know we heard from Jim that there's folks from, um, from all over the world. I'm uh, originally from North Carolina, but today I'm uh, in a hotel in Las Vegas, and um, so I, it, it's really neat to see how these webinars really make the world a really a smaller place um, with, with everyone from joining from all over. So uh, I don't want to waste a whole lot of time, um, you know, introducing and whatnot, but I do want you, want you to know who you're going to be hearing from today. Um, we have two really great presenters going to talk to us a little bit about um, the, the TALIS survey and, and what it all means and break it all down. So first we have Jim Wynn, um, who is uh, who's recently just taken up the CEO position of a nonprofit called Education Fast Forward. You may be familiar with the Education Fast Forward events. They're really, really um, they're really uh, a really great learning opportunity for you, uh, if, you uh, if you haven't ever heard of them, so definitely check those out. Um, prior to that, Jim was at uh, Promethean, and uh, he was leading the education strategy team there. And so you've got his Twitter handle there. You can follow him on Twitter. And then we also have Kristen Weatherby, who is the senior policy analyst at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. She's based in Paris. And she is the, the overseer of the, the TALIS survey, which is what we're going to talk about today. And so there you've got Kristen's uh, Twitter handles as well. And then I'm Stephen Anderson. I'm the content relationship evangelist for Promethean. Um, I have a background in education. I was a director of instructional technology, a classroom teacher. Um, most notably, a lot of people know me from Twitter as Web20 Classroom. Uh, and so I, tra I travel around, just like I am today, speaking on social media and education. Um, so I that's who you're going to be talking to today, so I'll leave, uh, leave Jim and Kristen's photos up there for you. Um, but I want to get started with kind of an overview. So I want to jump over to Kristen, and, and can you give us an overview of really what the results from the TALIS survey, what did you find uh, in this year's survey? Of course. And let me just, for those people on the call who do not know what TALIS is, I'll just briefly say TALIS is a survey of lower secondary teachers and school leaders in 34 countries. And by lower secondary, we mean teachers that teach students around the ages from 12 to, to 15 or 16. Um, and we surveyed over 100,000 teachers in these countries and asked them, um, a number of questions, but primarily around themes that uh, research show us affect um, effective teaching, so to speak. So um, we, I'll talk to you about a number of findings that we um, have been talking about recently, but I'll start with the teacher background. We asked teachers um, you know, normal background questions about whether they're male or female and their ages and that kind of thing, and it won't surprise you that the majority of teachers at this level are female in all countries except for Japan. Um, but we also had some new questions. TALIS was originally started in 2008, and it's grown quite a bit since then, and the questionnaire has grown as well. And in 2013, we asked a number of questions to teachers about their initial teacher training, whether they had participated in a formal education training program. Um, and we asked them specifically whether those programs included um, a practice, a teaching practice, um, content information, and pedagogical information for the subjects that they teach, and how effective that was in developing them as teachers and preparing them for their work as teachers. Um, not surprisingly, teachers that had training for the subjects that they currently teach in all of these three areas, content, pedagogy, and practice, felt more prepared for those elements in their own practice. Um, but slightly surprisingly, teachers by and large around the world felt very prepared by their initial teacher training, those teachers that did have it. Um, still, teachers get a lot of professional development in their, in their schools now, and teachers have expressed needs for professional development. What we found is that 88% of teachers across countries undertook professional development in the last 12 months, and 66%, so two-thirds, did not have to pay for any of it. This is great news. Um, teachers are getting access to the kinds of training that 
hopefully they are to training anyway. It might not be the training that they need or the best training for them, but they're getting access to training, and they're not having to, most of them are not having to pay for it. We found that teachers expressed, still express needs for professional development in the same areas that they expressed in 2008. So the majority of teachers um, who expressed a high level of need for professional development expressed it in three areas, the spe um, teaching spe students with special needs, uh, teaching with ICT, and using new technologies in the workplace. This was a new item from 2008, but you can see the technology focus and teaching students with special needs was, um, was quite important. The special needs focus is also quite interesting because we found when we asked school principals about the resource issues that they have in their schools, whether they had any sort of research resource shortages that would hinder the quality of instruction in their school, the number one resource shortage, resource shortage was around um, teachers that were qualified to teach students with special needs. So these two things kind of go hand in hand. Um, one of the areas of the survey that gets a lot of attention are the questions that we have around appraisal and feedback. So we ask teachers about the formal appraisal or evaluation that they receive on their teaching that may be tied to career advancement, um, that kind of thing. And as well, we ask them about um, any feedback they receive on their teaching. And this could be formal feedback as part of the appraisal process or informal feedback that could be from um, the principal or school management or other teachers or students even. And what we found is that 62% of teachers around the world felt that the appraisal and feedback they received did have a moderate or large effect in changing their teaching practices. So this is very good. Teachers that are receiving appraisal and feedback um, find that it's positive. Um, and teachers are getting, by and large, they're getting feedback on their teaching. So 88% of teachers across countries are getting feedback on their teaching. But while the teachers value the feedback that they do receive, nearly half of teachers feel that the appraisal and feedback systems in their schools are only um, taking place in order to fulfill administrative requirements. So they're not finding it any more than kind of a box ticking exercise at their schools, which is really a missed opportunity. Um, we also looked at teachers' teaching time and their working time. And we found that on average across countries, uh, teachers spend 38 hours a week working, with 19 of that being teaching in front of the class. And this ranges from um, a high of Japan. Japan has the highest number of working hours of any country of the teachers surveyed in Palace. Their teachers spend 54 hours a week working. However, they only spend 18 hours a week teaching in front of the class. And I'd like to just contrast that for you with the United States, where teachers also had one of the highest working time for the week. Um, teachers in the US spend 45 hours a week working. But in contrast to Japan, where the teachers only spend 18 hours a week teaching, US teachers spend 27 hours a week teaching. And this really doesn't enable them to do very much else. If they have this much teaching time, um, they're not able to spend as much time planning or working with other teachers, or working with students, or working with parents, or extracurricular activities, or any of the other myriad of things that teachers have to do every day. So it's just something to think about. Um, one of the key findings that we've been talking a lot about with TELUS is around teacher job satisfaction. Overall, around the world, the teachers that we surveyed um, are satisfied with their jobs at a rate of 90% or more. So nine out of 10 teachers say that they're satisfied with their jobs. But one of the most shocking findings that we found this time was that only 31% of teachers across countries feel that teaching is valued as a profession by their societies. So while teachers are happy being teachers, they don't feel that society values them. And this is something I think that's quite important as we think about the kinds of people we want to recruit into the teaching profession. And if we are looking at um, whether society values teaching and whether teachers feel that it's perceived, that it's, teachers perceive that it's valued, we're going to have difficulty keeping teachers in the profession if they don't feel like they're valued, and we're going to have difficulty recruiting the best candidates into the teaching profession. Um, another surprising result that I wanted to mention was also related to job satisfaction. And, and one of the things we hear in a lot of countries 
is that um, is all this talk about big class, large class sizes. And decreasing class sizes is one of the most common reforms, I think, that's, that's made across education systems around the world, but it's also one of the least efficient. It's very expensive to decrease class sizes and, and add staff. Um, and what we found was that as we looked, as we asked a teacher about their job satisfaction in relation to the size of their classes, and teachers who had 15 or fewer students in their class, all the way up to 36 or more students in their classes, the job satisfaction that they reported was really stable. Job satisfaction did not change, and this is across countries, as the class size increased. But what we found is that the bigger issue here was around the composition of the class. So as the percentage of students who have behavioral problems increased, teachers' job satisfaction went down quite markedly um, across countries. So those are the, some of the key findings from TELUS, as well as some of the, the shockers for us, Stephen. Now, now, Jim, you're familiar with the results as well. Is there anything that you found that, that surprised you? Kristen mentioned a couple of the ones that, that I want to touch on here in a, in a little while, but is there anything that you found that really that stood out to you? I think that the variation um, in the working week, as uh, Kristen was talking about just there, and the one I picked out was uh, in Chile, where the working week, according to the teachers, was 29 hours long, and they spent 27 hours teaching, I think, the same number of hours as the U.S., Kristen. Um, yeah. And yet, when you look across the whole um, hundred and odd thousand teachers, um, I think on average teachers say they spend seven hours planning and preparing, 19 hours teaching, five hours marking, and two hours on administration. So that's the average, but that's one of the problems with averages. It hides the extreme. So I don't know how teachers in Chile, if they're teaching for 27 and working for tw a working week of 29 in those two hours, can have anything like the same um, work uh, um, you know jobs if you like you know marking and and assessing and thinking ahead as in Japan where they work a hugely long week um, but only one third of their time is is actually in teaching so I think that's one big thing for me um, another thing um, that a third of teachers um, so they never carry out any cooperative activities with their colleagues um, now positively that's two thirds of teachers do but a third of teachers aren't collaborating and on the EFF 10 debate um, a few weeks ago when we debated the results for over two hours uh, th this this thread of the need to develop more collaboration in the teachers workforce really came through loud and strong um, but but there is, there is some sort of hint from teachers as well I think and again Chris you can tell me if I'm right or wrong here but I think in the US 50% of teachers thought that the purpose of feedback was more negative than positive, that professional development might come out of it, but it was all around, if you just allow me to use my colloquialism, this isn't from Talis, you know, to the weed out the weaker teachers people felt was the purpose of feedback. Um, and whilst some teachers um, received a lot of feedback, in one or two Scandinavian countries, I don't know, 80% of teachers said they'd never had any feedback in their jobs. So I think for, for me, Stephen, the big thing is the variation in uh, what's happening country by country. And I think it, it's it's really important to recognize that because quite often we, we we paint the whole teaching profession with the same brush. And the wonderful thing about TALIS is it's, it's, it's an enormous um, survey. And it is it is a big, grand selfie. It's, it's by teachers, it's teachers talking about themselves, it's about teachers, and fundamentally it's for teachers because you can look at the results and compare yourself with, um, with what everybody else is saying, but don't look at bland averages that you tend to get in the press and you know the press will come up with some figure and they'll pick one out and, and blight the whole profession with it. But if you have got the time to look at the numbers, there's some really interesting conclusions you can draw. So, so let's. So we'll talk about that. So one of the ones. So I come at it from a U.S. lens, and so I I I, I wanted to dive deep, kind of into this this area of PD. Um, so I I was a director of instructional technology. My my 
focus was on providing technology, professional development to teachers. It, I spent a great deal of my time trying to understand what it was that teachers wanted, what it was that teachers needed, and how we could best evaluate those results so we could improve the PD. Um, so one thing that the report does is it suggests that teachers participate more in professional development. but if there's a if there's a disparity between the time that they need for teaching and and like teachers in the US say that their time is already limited how how can we explore different types of PD opportunities or are there other are, was was there any information you know gained from the survey that that said oh this type of PD is is working in these countries or are there alternate methods of PD that are happening that are that are um, proving to be successful well, I think one thing that is interesting to look at, if you look at my the second slide I have on collaboration, and this is something that Jim touched on, which I think um, we had a long discussion on the education fast forward debate, and we've been having many other discussions about this as well. And you can see here that across countries, if you look, we ask teachers about kind of surface level collaboration that they do with other teachers. So we call this exchange and coordination. Things like um, discussing students with their colleagues, sharing resources, so like exchanging materials, um, attending team conferences, and um, looking at different you know, educational standards. And you can see that these surface level um, exchange and coordination activities are used by teachers a lot more, and this is the international average on the United States on this slide, than more in-depth professional collaboration activities. So things like team teaching, collaborative professional development, um, and observing other teachers teach and providing feedback. And it's, it's very interesting because we found um, that Collaboration is incredibly important for teachers, and teachers report higher levels of job satisfaction, higher levels of confidence in their own abilities when they participate in more collaborative practices with other teachers. So this is really important. This idea of teachers teaching in isolation, being in their classrooms, shutting the door, is should be a thing of the past. Um, but in some countries, it's, it's really not. And these kind of... Um, Collaborative activities could also be a kind of professional development. So think about team teaching, for example. You have two teachers or more. I've, I've uh, participated and observed classes where there's four teachers and over 100 students in the class. And you are always able to watch somebody else teach. You're always able to plan with other teachers. You're always able to discuss students, to work on assessments, all of that. Um, and you're always able to get feedback on your own teaching from your fellow teachers. The other thing that's a really interesting professional development activity that shouldn't be innovative that I've seen happening in, in schools around the world is just school principals giving time for teachers to observe their colleagues and provide feedback. Some of the most high performing countries um, in the OECD's PISA exam, such as Singapore and um, the system in Shanghai, have these kind of lesson study activities where it's a formal activity. Teachers get together. They watch another teacher teach, whether it's via video or live. They review what happened in the lesson, what went well, what could be improved. And then they work together to make the lesson better. They all come away with content that they can use in their own teaching. So this kind of collaboration is, is good for teachers in many ways and can provide feed professional development that also adheres to what we know quality professional development to be within the teacher's own context, um, working with other teachers in the school, and um, sustained <coughs> activity that's not just a one-shot. Um, I heard a professor in the U.S. recently call these one-shot professional development activities spray and pray. And so this is something that's, um, that's a bit different than that. There's a few comments actually coming in over the chat on the uh, webinar, Stephen, and um, they reflect actually some of the comments that we we had when we ran the education fast forward debate. I remember a teacher from Norway saying that often professional development hasn't really motivated people. It, it, it just fails to motivate the teachers, and it's uh, and, and similarly from one of our participants today, quite often the professional development is focused on the subject matter 
and and doesn't get into pedagogical issues and, co- and collaboration and so on. So I think the comments are really saying that maybe we need to look at the very nature of PD. And I think you were hinting at the delivery mechanism. And certainly in business, a, a lot of PD is now self-help PD, where businesses will provide uh, just-in-time opportunities for people to go and get that learning when they can. And certainly in my own experience, a um, mistake that I've made myself in the past when I was a principal was to put on really heavy professional development at the end of the day and when teachers had just had a really long teaching day. And the last thing they wanted to do was to think hard uh, about uh, about matters when they would want to is get home and, and get them with their marking. So I think the, the message is coming through is that professional development might be available. It might be I think, again, Chris, and did I read that in almost every country that, that 100% of teachers have got access to PD, but it's just not always taken up? You know, that, that's the fact. It's just not always taken up. I, I just wanted to make one other... 88%, yeah. 88. Well, it, yeah. It, it's a good number. Um, I just want to make clear that earlier, I, what I meant to say and what I said might have been two different things. I think quite often... People look at things like TALUS and pull out the negative percentages, whereas there are a lot of positive things in there that we, sh- we can read from. So I hope that that wasn't misunderstood. That I thought um, that I was saying the TALUS was a negative because you know, I've been talking to a lot of people, with Gavin Dykes in particular, about the fact that this is the biggest survey that there's been, and it is, you know, teachers are responding themselves. It's not somebody else talking about teachers. And we do seem to have sometimes a sort of a default setting that when we have big surveys, it, it's not going to work. You know, it's the big bad survey. Um, what I'm trying to say is if you get underneath the data, you can find data in your region that the averages might actually get rid of, and you can find out what exactly is going on in, in your in your country. So I think the other thing is collaboration as well. It does take time, and I'd like to add to Kristen's point that you know, the leadership in schools have, have got to make the opportunities for learning about new ways to learn, collaboration being one, team teaching uh, in the classroom being another. Unless we help teachers with their pedagogy as well as their subject matter expertise, then things aren't going to change much. Well, and I think Kristen touched on the one that I think is, is I think, most important, and that's just the opportunity to take time to go see other teachers and um, in before I left the district um, that I was working in, we were instituting a bring your own device policy, so allowing kids and students to bring their own technology to the classroom. And one of the things that our teachers said to us over and over and over again was they wanted the opportunity to go see the teachers who we had been piloting. So we had we had I had six teachers who had been already doing this in their classroom, and the teachers wanted to go to see them, and and it was it, it was near impossible for many reasons to, to just be allowed to go do that. But even in their own building, teachers rarely have the same time. That they don't have the common planning times. They don't have um, – there are so many other things that are happening. That, but just something simple like going and observing other teachers in your own building can be very, very, uh, very powerful. Um, so I want I wanna, uh, to, to move on to the, um, to the working hours. So – we and, and and Kristen, you touched on this a little earlier that that there there are teachers who are reporting that half of their their time is spent directly in the instruction of students. But again, through my U.S. lens, these are the countries that the U.S. often points to as you know the the, the leaders and the models of education, the the ones we quote unquote compete with in the world. So why why is that? Why are the why are the countries where they're spending the least amount of time? Why do they have the students who are outperforming? Yeah, well, it's it's just a matter of what the teachers are doing with the rest of their time. Honestly, when we think about teachers, we think about their main work being up in front of the class teaching, but there's so much more that goes into it. I mean, just the amount of planning and, you know, if teachers are supposed to be keeping up with educational research and, and looking for new pedagogies and trying to use new tools, how are they supposed to find the time to do this if they are, you know, the teachers in Chile, I think it's impossible, but, but even the teachers in the U.S. when they have such a heavy workload in front of the class. So if you look at um, some other countries, for example, so if you look at my previous slide here, Stephen, it'll show, again, the, the U.S. Um, averages around class time and how teachers spend their time in relation to um, in relation to how they 
in relation to the, the international average, sorry. So the one thing that's interesting too is that there's some high performing education systems like Ontario and Canada where and and Finland does this as well, where they, they actually take a lot of teacher time to identify um, in Finland, it's students with special needs so that they can identify their issues early and, and deal with them and really spend individual time with students. And in Canada, it's, it's with the big immigrant population that they have so that they have special teachers and support staff and the teachers in the classroom spending time to um, really follow these students who are immigrants and may not speak the same language and all of this. And they still are able to have incredibly high performing systems because the teachers have this kind of time and they're not just saddled with so many um, hours in front of the class. Now, this kind of reform is challenging um, because it involves more teachers, really. So it involves more staff in the school, not necessarily um, smaller class sizes by having more staff. You might actually end up with larger class sizes, but you have more t freedom from the teaching hours. So it's, it's, it it's could potentially be an expensive reform and a difficult reform to institute, but it's something that, that is, happens in a lot of the high-performing systems. I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's really it's, it's interesting that you know, as my wife is a teacher, and so um, I look at the amount of time that she spends you know, just preparing to, to teach her kids, and then the, the when she's in her classroom, the, the interruptions that she has, either because um, oh, this, this student needs to get pulled out for this reason, or these group of students are going over here, or you know, if you, if you really break down the actual time that, that's spent on actual teaching, and then everything that goes into that, it, it, it can be, it, it's definitely a challenge. It's definitely um, something that, that needs to be taken a look at. Um, another thing that I thought was really fascinating was that 90% of the teachers believe that students should be given the opportunity to work out solutions to problems before a teacher intervenes, <coughs> yet only a few of those countries um, say that, ha that half of the teachers there report that that's the best way for students to learn. So there's, there's a real, there, there's a difference in opinion there that 90% of teachers believe that this is the best way for students to learn, but then half of the teachers in those countries say that that's how they're doing it. So what is, what, what is the difference? Is there, are, there, are there cultural differences? Is it differences in um, pedagogical styles across the world? What is, what, what's happening there to cause that difference? Mm, I th we noticed a few funny things here in, when we looked at teachers' beliefs and practices. So most teachers say that they believe in, in 21st century pedagogies, that kind of thing, but then teachers are not instituting them, and so it's, it's across the board. Um, the specific issue that, that you mention, um, I think it might be slightly cultural as well. If you look at uh, one of the countries where fewer teachers report that students should be given the opportunity to work out solutions to problems on their own um, is Italy. And Italy also has one of the oldest teaching workforces in Talis, and they've also been teaching the longest of most of the countries in Talis. So it's possible that these teachers have just been educated differently. And there's, there's an issue in Talis um, that, you know, in some countries the teaching workforces are quite old. And, you know, I'm not saying anything against older teachers that this is, that this is an issue with all older teachers because, again, I think Jim's issue of um, averages and, and variance comes in to play here. But I think that, um, I think that a lot of teachers were educated when they may not have been educated in, in these 21st century pedagogies. And I think the more I've been talking to institutes of teacher education or at conferences around teacher education, the more um, we, people are looking at the kind of training that happens in those institutes as well. When were those teacher trainers trained? How were they trained? Are they modeling the kind of pedagogies that, that teachers are supposed to be using in order to give students these new skills? Um, you know, so the teachers may have read the research and understand the theory and believe in it, but just may not know how to do it. The other thing that we, um, we looked at too uh, is kind of these active practices, student-centered practices, and we focused on things like whether teachers teach with ICT, um, whether they assign students group work, and whether they um, assign students project that take, projects that take more than a week to complete. And we found certain conditions that um, 
made teachers more likely to use those kinds of practices in their classroom. So uh, one of the conditions was the kind of professional development that teachers have reported participating in. So if they were involved in a network of teachers or if they were involved in um, uh, individual or collaborative research, they were more likely to use those three active practices. But the other thing that's, that's quite interesting is teachers that had reported positive classroom climate, so they had an easier time getting students to settle down, there wasn't a lot of disruptive noise, those teachers also reported a higher likelihood of using those active practices. So it might be also um, the kind of classrooms that these teachers have. In some countries, they teachers reported a lot more well. Did we lose Kristen there? But let, let me fill the gap yeah. if we've just got a problem with Kristen, um, because you, you, bring, you bring up a really interesting set of points about the age of teachers. Um, the 90% the of teachers who said they'd like to use uh, collaborative work, but only 50% do, uh, and, and associated issues. Now, I, I often show a little video clip of, a, of an English teacher working with a group of students, who are sh two of whom are interviewing each other, and a third is, is making a video. And the, the teacher um, is helping the, the student with the camera frame the, the, the uh, interview. And it looks great. It looks like the teacher really getting their hands dirty, you know, doing um, collaborative work. Then I play the video a second time, and we look in the background. And in the background, there, there are kids wandering around the classroom, not really on task. And the point I make in the video is that the craft of that teacher to run that class is, is a different craft of the classroom to run in the class when you're standing at the front. So I think where, where the, the uh, PD sometimes fails, it will say, you know, go and do group work, but it doesn't give the teachers the advice necessarily on, you know, how is it you run a class with six groups of five kids so that you are in control and the kids are safe and they're all on task. And, and it's a lot more difficult to do that than I think people realize. I, I, I was brought into the profession with a book by a guy called Michael Marlin called The Craft of the Classroom. And it, it assumed that you took 100% of your lesson was from the front. Now, interestingly, in a piece of research that um, I've had cited to me from the European Union, in terms of who is using technology um, most interestingly, what the research says apparently is that older teachers are using much more varied pedagogies with technology than younger teachers. Now that might surprise a lot of us because I think the rhetoric is it's the other way around. And I think the inference is that the older teachers have actually got used to how to use different approaches in the classroom, so they can use different approaches with technology. And younger teachers who haven't learned their trade yet are still sticking to the standing at the front of class talking because, frankly, that is an easier way to, to teach because you can be in more control. So I'm not surprised at that 90%, 50%. I think that's a reflection of not being able to get access to um, to the right forms of PD, which would tell a mathematics teacher on how to use group uh, learning and, and um, authentic learning problem solving in a lesson uh, as opposed to just putting lots of pictures of pie charts on the board and having the kids copy them down. Yeah, Jim, I love that, that okay, point good. actually because one of the things that Talis found was that um, in a lot of countries, a teacher's level of self-efficacy, so their confidence in their own abilities as a teacher, increased as they got more experience as a teacher. Now, in some countries, mm. it kind of plateaued or fell off as teachers were um, further on in the profession and their experience, but, but in most countries, it stayed positive. And this may not be surprising, but I think it contributes to what you're saying as well. Teachers are more confident in the pedagogy and content of, of what they're teaching, and they might be more willing to try new things. They might be more confident with things like classroom management, so they're able to manage these kinds of things. So I, I think that's quite interesting. And I think it applies to the percentages, sorry, Selena, I think it applies to the percentages we've seen for the people who use IT, because you know, one moment you have children writing in exercise books or, or painting or whatever, and you bring in IT and the kids are staring at screens, you can't see what they're doing, some are looking at the baseball results, some are watching the World Cup final replay, and teachers feel out of control. So we need to help teachers so w with understanding, you know, what's the best practice? In fact, um, Keith Kruger of Cozen during the EFF debate says, 
his experience is that pe teachers just want to know what works. And they've carried out some research into what works. And I think we would see a lot, if, if we could get teachers to collaborate more, and by that I mean talk to each other about what works, I think we'd see the education changing really quickly. So it, 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 it's interesting to hear you both talk about experience, where you, you need the experience as a teacher to be uh, to, to understand your content area, and you need the experience to understand how that classroom management is going to work in your classroom. And that's definitely um, something that, that I experienced in, in, in my role as, as an educator. But it's also interesting how teachers who have perhaps had more experience are less likely to try those new things. Is, are, those two, are those two things in conflict with each other? I'm not sure they're in conflict with one another, but they, they, they give you dilemmas. And, and again, if, if we go back to what people said, um, Tarek Shauke said on the debate that standards drive innovation away as people try to actually perform to a standard. Whereas uh, Jenny Lewis in, in Australia, Tarek was in Cairo, Jenny Lewis said standards will force teachers to talk to each other and see how other teachers are teaching and get themselves out of their, their locked door classroom. So there are different views on this, but I think it, is, it does feel like a conflict. Mm. So yeah, I want no, to jump to... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Kristen. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> So I want, I want to jump to, to um, school leaders. So there was a – one of my areas of focus with professional development, especially around technology, has been around school leaders. So I take a real interest in anything involved with, with leadership. And um, so one thing that I, that I was reading in the report said that if, if school leaders engaged in more of that instructional leader role, so they, 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 they took on less of that administrator or sit in, the, sit in their office, they were more involved in their school – they, the schools had better professional development plans. They were they had, were more involved with teacher planning, and they had higher levels of mutual respect amongst the the teachers in their building. What is the barrier to more school leaders having those opportunities in in any country? Well, I think there's two things here, and I'll have you flip to my last slide, Stephen, if you don't mind. Um, but I think the two things are time and capacity. So I think uh, one of the things that our chapter on school leadership really stresses in the Palace report is the sheer number of things that school leaders are responsible for, which seem to be increasing every day. And it seems like, um, you know, first of all, there's not enough hours in the day for school leaders to do all these things by themselves, and no one person can possibly have this high level of expertise in all of these areas. So one of the things that we talk about is distributed leadership or distributed decision making. And it's, um, it's really quite important for teachers as well. We talked about um, how you know, less than a third of teachers around the world feel that teaching is valued as a profession. But when we looked at those teachers who reported being able to make decisions at a school level, so they were given the authority to do this, they were more likely um, to report that teaching is valued as a profession. So it's really important for um, <coughs> teachers' perception of, of themselves and their roles. It also provides them with additional skills and additional authority at the school level and, and possibly a sense that their career is advancing. So there's lots of benefits to this, not the least of which is it frees up some of the principal's time. So the school leader is then able to spend more time on things like instructional leadership. But what I would point out on this slide is we asked um, school leaders about their formal education and whether it included um, training in instructional leadership. And we found that a fifth of school leaders have never had any training in instructional leadership. And around a third, it's not on this slide, but around a third have only had this training once they have become a school leader. So it it seems like this is an area where school leaders could use some additional training as well, and in some countries more than others, as you can see from, from this slide. I mean, that's just the average, but there's quite a few countries on the left um, part of the slide who, you know, over 50% of school leaders or over 40% of school leaders have not had any kind of training in instructional leadership. It's interesting that there's quite a lot of... Um evidence outside of TALIS where um, the 
the the leadership that that single person gets at the at the top is the one thing that enables the teachers to do what they need to do. Uh, but someone's just pointed out on the um, on the chat that it's about time we moved away from the paradigm of heroic leadership, uh, where one person represents the elected few. Um, I think whilst that might be true, it's that one person that is the enabling factor to um, to allow teachers to change. And I think Andreas Schleicher didn't he say? Again, I hope I'm quoting him right. That schools are the unit of change, uh, but the teachers are the agents of change. Um, and that's where it's got to get down to. And I think that's the important thing. If you don't allow teachers to be the, the agents of change, then it really won't change. Um, in, in my day, um, in England, all, teach, all head teachers had a teaching background, whereas that's not true in some countries where you know, the principal can be effectively a, an administrator. So I think that's an interesting um, point to raise, that we are talking again across a, a number of different countries and I think, what was the number of teachers we had surveyed? A hundred and something thousand? So it's a really big number. Yeah. Yeah. 107,000, and across some 30-odd countries. But the variation is one country has a principal who's never taught, uh, and another country where you couldn't get the job unless you've taught. So again, I'm just, I think I'm reiterating my point, Stephen, about be careful about looking at the averages. Yeah, I mean, it, it, to me, you know, I've had I've had lots of administrators who came from a lot of diverse backgrounds, and um, you know, I had I had a principal who went straight from being a math teacher to being a principal. I had an assistant principal who went straight from being a guidance counselor to a principal, and and so in where where I am in in my part of the U.S., our our administrators have to complete an administrative um, training course as a master's degree, but. Um, a lot of that course is specifically tied to not instructional leadership. It's tied to administrative leadership, understanding school law, understanding budgeting. And I think if more time is spent, you know, no matter no matter the country, I, you know, I think I think school leadership should revolve around that instructional leadership. Um, it, it should be. I, I would want a, a leader in my building who who understood, who planned with me, who sat with me, who understood my content, who understood my pedagogy, and and who could also balance that against the, the other the other part of their role, which is that administrative part of their role. But really, I think our schools, no matter where they are, need that that leader in their building who has that instructional background, who understands what teachers are doing and how how it should be done, and and who can provide that that leadership and that insight. So I, I know we're running we're running short on time, and I, there was, there's one question that I really that that I really wanted to get to um, before we, we before we wrap up, and um, it's it's one that that is, is U.S. focused, but it's looking at at Finland. So in the U.S., we commonly look at Finland as kind of this model of how learning should be done, um, and and the report says that that between 22 and 45 percent of teachers there have never received any feedback on their teaching in their current school. And we touched on this a little earlier about one of the surprises. So if reflection and feedback are an important part of that growth process, how does this translate to students who are outperforming their counterparts? So we, as, as Kristen mentioned earlier, that feedback is kind of one of the things that was surprising, that teachers wanted the feedback and they, 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 they desired it, but they felt it was just a checkbox. They felt it was just something that, that needed to be done. So how does, how does that translate into to what we're seeing with, with student quality worldwide? Well, this is a really surprising um, finding for us, and a lot of the findings in TALIS on Finland were surprising, so much so that we contacted our Finnish government colleagues who sit on the TALIS board, and we had lots of conversations with them about whether they were surprised by any of the findings and, and whether they could help us kind of describe the cultural situation so that, so that we could understand better the findings. And one of the things that they said specifically um, as, as many people may know, Finnish teachers are required to have a master's degree before they become teachers. It's incredibly competitive to get even to get into um, education institutions to prepare to become teachers. There's an enormous um, vetting process before people are even admitted to the to become teachers to those programs. Um, so they really feel that teachers, once they are in the classroom, are autonomous, high-level professionals which actually is what you know, we kind of all want teachers to be, these high-level knowledge workers, or they should be these days, something that Andreas Fleischer says all the time as well. Um, 
but as such, actually observing teachers is not part of the school principal's job description in Finland. They trust teachers. They trust the teacher's level of professionalism, and they feel that observation is not needed. In terms of feedback, they said basically that um, feedback, no feedback means that everything's okay. So if the teacher is not receiving feedback on their teaching, that means that they're doing a good job. The other thing, though, that was interesting about Finland is that the TALIS results actually um, actually did reveal that there were, there's a problem with their professional development system. They, they feel themselves that it's not functioning properly and that teachers are not getting the professional development that they may want. And they also felt that, and I heard this from um, Linda Darlingham, the professor at Stanford University in the US, that there's this idea of formal and informal, where we may be talking and tell us about formal mentoring systems or formal um, professional development. And there might just be practices that exist in Finland, but are just, they just exist. They're just part of the teacher's everyday life, so they don't think of them as some sort of a formal system or some sort of, uh, like mentoring, for example, or some sort of professional development. They just do it. So again, it's this idea of autonomous teachers who are able to decide what they need and, and kind of find a way to get that. I think there's a, the one. I think we're over time, but if you allow me to say one thing, there was a, a, a stunning graph that Andrea showed, linking the esteem to which teachers felt they were held by their local societies and PISA scores. And there's a very strong correlation. And I think there's some sort of really important link here between that word trust, um, the, the autonomy that that leads to, the respect that that gets because teachers are trusted and therefore the results. Now, I think I've spoken to the Finnish um, the people as well. And if you say to them, what's the ethos behind your whole education system? They just say trust. But it doesn't mean to say they've got it right. And I think they might have, and I think they've, they have got it right. And, you know, wouldn't we all love for teachers to be trusted everywhere as step one and then get some other things wrong? And, but once that trust's in place, you're in a much better position to put the things right that you might have got wrong along that journey. I think that trust is a, is a big, is a, is a huge factor, especially in the, uh, in the U.S. is, you know, we talk about student performance and teacher quality and a lot of those things, and, and trust is not really one of those words that's ever mentioned. So I think that's a, that's a hugely important when you're, when you're talking about teachers as professionals, is, is trusting that they're, they're doing their job well. But I also think balancing that against feedback, too, as, as a, I, I don't know that I could, I, I thrive on feedback. I want people to tell me whether it's I'm doing a presentation or I'm, I'm teaching or whatnot. I wanted, I love the feedback, and so I, I don't, I don't know how I would survive in a system that didn't provide feedback or in, in a system that said, well, if you don't get any feedback, you're doing well. Um, but I, I yeah. just want to wrap up by, by just asking this, this question that you know I get, I got asked a lot um, when, when I was talking to people about, about the TALIS survey. You know, what does it, what does it really mean for the average teacher in the country that participated in the survey? What is, what can, what can people do? with the results uh, in, in their country um, specifically? Well, we've, we asked this question of ourselves as well when we were preparing the main report, because what we were finding, a lot of um, interesting results that we felt teachers and school leaders could use now to change um, their own situation, to improve the, the teaching and learning environments in their schools. Um, and so one of the things that we did was we developed this teacher's guide to TALIS, which is a short, free document that talks about the, um, the TALIS results from a teacher and school leader point of view, explains them um, in, a, we hope, a very clear way, and then provides recommendations that basically says uh, what can teachers do, what can school leaders do. Because we believe really strongly the OECD typically focuses on policymakers and providing advice and guidance <coughs> to policymakers based on our data. But I think the situation is just different <laughs> with teachers and teaching because policymakers can make all policy they want. And at the end of the day, not all of it may trickle down to the classroom and, and make its way into every single classroom. The change has to happen from teachers and from school leaders as well. So we've tried to provide a guide that would help uh, people on the ground doing the hard work really um, use the data as well. I think we're over time, Stephen, but I, I'd just like to say that the data is real. It's from teachers. It's about teachers. So it's there to be analyzed. And 
even if Kristen's teacher guide doesn't hit the mark for you, go and look at the data and look at what it's saying so that you can, from the ground floor, in the classroom, at the chalk face, tell policymakers what they need to know. So it's a two-way process, not just one way. And I can say from just from from spending time with the the uh, the teacher report, it was it was really it's an excellent breakdown of of everything from the the overall report. So for for the average teacher, it's definitely worth um, checking out. And we can include links to um, to the full report and to the um, to the teacher report in the uh, when we post the recording. So I, I just want to thank uh, thank both of you for for taking time out today to talk with us. Um, this was really, really fascinating, and um, I hope that everybody who joined uh, learned something um, and uh, can definitely go out and check out the TALUS report and check out the, the TALUS teacher report. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, everyone. The recording will be available in due course. I'm going to stop the recording now.